Good evening, everyone. My name is Renee Green, and I'm head of uh, ACT, Art, Culture, and uh, Technology in the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. And uh, I welcome you this evening uh, to experiments in thinking, action, and form, uh, the ACT lecture series, uh, which is uh, currently subtitled Cinematic Migrations. Uh, and this is linked uh, to uh, a project called Cinematic Migrations, which is taking place over the next two years. We're in the second year now of it. And um, I'm very happy this evening to welcome uh, Lovett Cadagnone, John Lovett and Alessandro Cadagnone, uh, to be with us and participate in this project, uh, which is also a seminar. And um, the, some of the upcoming events uh, related to the series will be uh, uh, our guests, John Acumfra and Lena Gopal of Smoking Dogs Films um, coming from London. They will be here uh, during the week of November 4th, and I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, and on November 25th, Tarek El Haik, and December 9th, Joan Jonas. Um, and so uh, to introduce Lovett Cadignone, uh, I can describe him uh, in this way um, and in relation to our project. Uh, as artistic practices broaden to embrace a variety of new media and expansive models such as cinema, theater, and music, practices that interrogate notions of authorship, the duo Lovett Cadignone favor forms of cooperation as their source of inspiration mapping a work methodology and introducing new formats, their band, the staging of plays, and the casting of actors instead of themselves. They seek to critique their own practice. John Lovett and Alessandro Cardignoni have been working together in New York since 1995, using photography, performance, video, sound, and installation. The duo unfolds relations of power as manifested in explicit cultural signifiers as well as clandestine or unconscious practices. Their work has been exhibited in solo shows, uh, and quite a few. Um, I won't name them all, um, too many to name, <laughs> but I'll just mention a few. Um, uh, relatively recently at LA Art, uh, LA, LAX Art in Los Angeles, uh, also um, at Museo Marino Marini in Florence, uh, the Sculpture Center in New York, uh, MoMA, PS1 in New York, uh, and they have also performed at the ICA in Philadelphia, Jetson Memorial Church in New York, ICA Boston. Um, their work is also has been included in uh, shows at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, Cobra Museum, um, Amstel Veen, uh, Museum Ludwig in Cologne, De Appel in Amsterdam, NGBK in Berlin, and Palais de Tokyo in Paris. And so without any more elaboration, I welcome warmly mm -hmm. Love Academy Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> As in all our presentation, we'd like to start with a quote that we hope can help frame the content of the argument to be presented. Um, furthermore, today we would like to use a piece of our work as a quote, the, the, the piece in, on, in the screen is uh, called PPP, a radical uh, um, empiricism. Um, pertinent to, to today's subject is also explicatory of the way in which we incorporate citations in our work. Extrapolated from uh, the original context, they serve to create new meanings determined by the new context in which they are readapted. <clears throat> the quote that we, the, we use of uh, Pierpaolo Pasolini from Heretical Empiricism uh, that says, that reads, they go beyond the firing line and find themselves on the other side in enemy territory. Here, automatically, they are closed into a bag, or to extend the metaphor more vividly, they are crowded together into a concentration camp. 
which they then, as happens, transform equally automatically into a ghetto. There, where everything has become transgression, there is no more danger. It's actually in the, in the book, um, Pasolini is specifically talking about um, experimental filmmakers of, uh, and he actually cites them by name. And in his uh, usual controversial way, he basically, um, he says, there are some filmmakers who carried away by their heroic impetus or by the incitement and applause of the few who, as a result of a law, which is obviously and literally self-destructive, are the only ones who count, push themselves beyond the front line of transgression. Um, the idea when we, this, this piece was made in relation is a, is a slight projection on a leather jacket. Pasolini was also known for always wearing a leather jacket, so that was a, another reference to the, the persona. And, um, but the show was, in 2005 was a show at Artist Space that um, it was called Log Cabin. It was uh, in relationship to um, how to deal with uh, queer issues at the, at the time, which was like 2005. And so the, clearly for us to like this um, quote extrapolated from that context of what Pasolini was talking is and in the context of the show in which the piece was uh, presented uh, created a completely diff different meaning which was in relationship to um, queer identity. Um, quote, we need more complex ways of understanding the multivalence and tactics of power to understand forms of resistance, agency, and counter-mobilization that eludes or stall state power, Judith Butler, end of quote. Today we would like to introduce our practice and map a work methodology that had looked at forms of cooperation as a model uh, and an inspiration, in particular cinema, but also theater and music, and identifying these expansive models a way to interrogate and question notions of authorship. We combine elements of gay S&M subculture with literary, cinematic, and discursive quotations circling around the latent violent dynamic of loss, dominance, subjugation, and resistance. Expanding upon an interest in the political ramification of conflating public and private, the works we will be showing today, starting in 2006, has departed from self-reflexive strategies to issues of collective identity, such as social isolation, disorientation, and powerlessness powerlessness, and addresses the absor absorption of underground tactics of resistance in relation to the current political situation. Important theoretical and aesthetic influences in our production are derived from the work of historical radical cultural figure in literature, critical thinking, cinema, theater, and punk music. Specific influence, citation, and adaptation in the work we will be viewing today includes Antonin Artaud, Theater of Cruelty, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, Anti-Theater, and the movie Carell, Peter Handke's seminal work from the 60s, Offending the Audience, Bertolt Brecht's Life of Galileo's, An Aphorism by Friedrich Nietzsche, The Work and Life of Pier Paolo Pasolini, Jean Genet, The Music of the Dam, Joy Division, Gang of Four, and Icon the Banniment. We will present and end our talk with a project that was born initially as an auxiliary to Love e Codagnone, and a way to critique our practice that had become very central in our practice, which is Candidate, it's the band. The first work we will show is um, from 2006 and is titled uh, Because My Body Can Never Be Touched. And uh, in our production, the year marked a real uh, change in the way in which we engage ourselves, in the way we disengage ourselves from the work and started to um, have actor replacing us and uh, is also the year uh, we stopped doing performances, which was which until then, until 2005, had been a predominant um, practice of ours. We stopped completely, and we started to they, like to talk. We 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 started to um, be more interested in in sculpture and talk about the sculpture as a um, uh, performative object. Um, because my body, my body can never be touched. There's a, a, an actor that roams the empty street of New York at night and performs without an audience through a megaphone the, the chapter La Recherche de la Fecalité, the pursuit of fecality from Artaud radio play to have done with the judgment of God, of God, 
written for French radio in 1947. Um, the play that um, Antonin Artaud wrote was actually um, censored uh, the day before it was supposed to be aired on uh, national French radio. And, um, but Artaud actually did um, a recording, which we had a, um, which was actually available that we had a, a CD in which he recorded the, the play and, um, um, and in, 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 Art, in Artaud's fashion, the sounds that he employs from the, with the, all different instruments from uh, all sounds, um, verbal and non, you know, um, understandable and non-understandable are part of the, of the play. Um, the actor that we use, that we, uh, this was the first time we worked with him and then we kept working with him a lot, um, being a, a method actor, he actually studied very closely the, the recording of Artaud and recreated with the bullhorn or megaphone the sound that Artaud was creating in the studio with other um, uh, instrument at, in the same way that Artaud did in the, in the um, um, in his recording. The block of the voice, articulation and being heard, played a fundamental role in Artaud's thought. For him, one suppression was visible through a silent cry, and in a certain respect, only hearable through silence. It was less a matter of words than of sounds, which were supposed to painfully touch the spectators. Artaud's idea of a theater of deficiency and crisis as a contemporary parallel in our video installation the location where the video was shot represents the perfect example of the progressive gentrification of New York. The camera follows the solitary actor who wanders through a commercialized, cleaned up district in which autonomous freedoms have nearly disappeared, in which there is no longer a response. The fact that he can only cry out his unlistened protest, in quotes, is like a symbolic farewell to repressed subcultures. At the same time, this reenactment is rooted in an authentic contemporary feeling about life, a fecal hymn of praise to dirty corporeality, turns offensively against the suppression of aggressions and wishes which can no longer be articulated in the face of increasing economic and political control. Artaud represents an intellectual refusal to transform oneself into a consensus fun functionary. It was fundamental to Artaud to extend the questioning of life's pre-existing orders to all life's ambience, wherever written forms had crept in or where an order, an order of style to humankind had already set itself into motion. He longed to return to body language, the primitive quality of the expression of the body which had been buried since the age of the Renaissance. This restatement of body language which, within linguistic space was to be of fundamental importance in the 70s, and it is no mere coincidence that uh, the recovery of Artaud and his work happened during that period, thanks in particular to the evident interest of the French post-structuralist philosophers. And thus Artaud became a secret, a secret guarantor who did not distinguish between language and the unconscious, interpreted through the use of dreams, nonsense, stutter, delirium, all these incomprehensible signs which are untranslatable in the recognized codes of society.
that is to die alive. There is in being something particularly tempting for man, and this something is none other than Kaka. <laughs> without 
that of the infinitesimal within. And he chose the infinitesimal within, where one need only squeeze the spleen, the tongue, the anus, or the glands. And God, God himself, squeezed the movement. Does God exist? If he does, he is shit. If he does not, see the public shrugging <laughs> shoulders, but the so-called Christ is none other than he who, in the presence of the crab louse God, consented to live without a body, while an army of men descended from a cross to which God thought he had long since nailed them, has revolted and, armed with steel, blood, with fire and with bones, advances, reviling the invisible, to have done with God's judgment, to have done with God's judgment. I wanted to add also the, I mean, this is half of the video. The video is actually 20 minutes, and uh, it's divided in two parts. In, uh, it's usually, like, when it's shown, it's shown in, in, in its entirety. Um, well, I wanted to add that um, in, the write, in the writing of Arto, there is incredible lucidity mixed with, like, moments of, like, uh, and in a, but equally uncomprehensible uh, parts which are also were the result of a life, like uh, uh, Arto, by the time he died, he had gone through 36 um, um, uh, electroshocks that basically had 
destroy this brain. Um, the other things I wanted to add regarding this video is that um, it was very important as a reference, uh, Elephant by Gus Van Sant. And so even the choice, so the, the sound, even though the actor actually performed the sound in the street, and there was a recording of that, the sound used in the video is actually recorded in a studio, which again, because of the, um, we, when we explained to him what we wanted, and the fact what we wanted was that it seemed like if it could be someone, um, they, the, the impression is that it's either someone thinking of reciting, but it's not really actually reciting it, it's almost like a, an internal space. So we had to create a space for him in which he felt like being in his, inside his own brain to record the, 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 the um, this to be inside himself to, to record the sound. And, um, and the other thing is that in Elephant, the chronology, like when you follow the video, is, is the editing is purposely, there is no consequentiality in like in some of the way it moves around so that the time is not the time as we perceive it, but it's a time that is only to do with the actor and his, his, his um, performance. <coughs> the other thing I wanted to specify also is that for me to read, uh, it helps me to stay focused because otherwise I tend to um, um, go in tangents and uh, since we have a, a very, um, um, the time is restricted so I wanted to be able to um, try to show as much in um, in the time that we have. Um, so, um, this is a <coughs> these images are from a, the, uh, a show that we did at uh, PS1 MoMA in uh, 2007, 2008, called Interruption of a Course of Action, where the video that we're showing is actually was um, part of the show. And um, um, in the show, like there was the, the introduction of certain elements that then have been uh, um, recurring for a few years, and one of is exactly was the is the video that we showed, and um, the megaphones that you can see the sculpture, and um, and then with this the beginning of um, a production that we did of. Uh, of uh, mirrors where with, um, the mirrors basically are blacked out except for like uh, the writing. Uh, this one in particular, this installation in particular as a, quotation, as a um, citation from uh, Hakim Bey from the Temporary Autonomous Zone, the ontology of anarchy and the uh, poetic terrorism. And the um, quote reads, chaos never died. If I were to kiss you here, they'd call it an act of terrorism. So let's, tra let's take our pistols to bed and wake up the city at midnight like drunken bandit bandits, celebrating with a fusillade the message of the taste of chaos. Um, <clears throat> so the, I, the, suppressed, the suppressed, suppressed voice is kind of a late motive of the work in, uh, from 2006 on. And, um, um, so even the, the two megaphones facing each other can be interpreted as a symbol of blockade or disrupted understanding in which communication is um, obsolete. The two speakers, the, the, they drawn each other out by the, by the sculpture itself. It's one of these objects that we call uh, performative in the sense that they imply a performance that need, need not to be uh, performed. Um, um, the, the other things that, like, uh, that was introduced at the moment, like our way of working with fetishism in this particular instance is changed into like a fetishization of power in which objects that usually are um, in relation to uh, controlling and um, to like um, are rendered in a way in which they're almost like um, they're render so beautiful that they're almost a wish to your own um, um, uh, repression. And, um, and the other things that the, the way in which we have talked about the, the mirrors 
in which we basically contradict the usual communication model, the, the, the mirror, by blocking the, the, the reflectiveness of all the mirror by leaving only the letters, is that they function as an alphabet of, for a negative visual language driven by subversive autistic energy and, and the desire for, one own, for one's own downfall. <coughs> um, so uh, here is the, 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 the video has always been shown as a, as an installation, but uh, as a monitor piece. So in 2007, and um, also like we have uh, concentrated to like show as many work as, uh, as how much we have been collaborating. So a lot of the work that we've been showing tonight, we will be showing today their collaboration with other people. So in 2007, as part of Performa, we, had, um, we uh, presented uh, a race, which was a, a play, and, um, um, and it's a collaboration with a playwright, uh, Tom Cole. Oh. Um, the a race was informed mainly by uh, the writing of, uh, the, the text is actually, uh, Partly the origin of writing by um, Tom Cole, and partly is uh, is uh, pieces from a, um, a book um, that was uh, uh, published in Italy in um, 1982, and um, it's the memoir of a terrorist. It's actually a book that nobody knows if it's ever is an anonymous. Uh, is written, nobody knows if it's actually a real um, account of uh, someone that went underground and actually went back to live and never, you know, was caught or, uh, or is actually someone that is a complete um, um, manufactured uh, experience. But it's the recount of like a, a person, basically a person like a young guy, which was, they were mainly at that time, who decides to go underground and becomes a terrorist. And his account of how he slowly goes underground and uh, what happens while he's living and you know, and from the most mundane things of like even what it's like to you know having to go and try to have sex to like what it's like to like live a life that you know, and the interesting to me the most interesting part of the of the book is actually um, how in his, this really radical figure that he's representing is actually in his moment of extreme solitude, he starts to like even make amendments for his parents and all the bourgeois values that they represent. In some ways, it's, it's like he's having a moment of reconciliation with them. And it's like there's all these weird parts of it. And, um, but a lot of it, the, the, of the play comes from this also um, interest that we, I had for a long time because I grew up in Italy in the 70s, so through, um, the year of, uh, as they used to call Anni di Piombo, of terrorism. And um, therefore, my, for not only my growing up, but also my, the, my teenage years in which we lived all the repressed laws that were introduced through and never, you know, and of course, um, conveniently were never um, abolished after terrorism or after the, the main wave of terrorism were you know, um, subdued, and um, there is, uh, and then the other event that was very much in, informing the, the play was uh, an event that happened in Germany in 2003, when uh, where a person uh, um, deliberately went to meet someone else to be uh, eaten as a, as a sort of a sexual exchange, and for me, for us, it was not at all the actual act itself of cannibalism, which I'm not interested in, and I understand it very well in uh, anthropological terms, but like, um, I was, we were really interested in the idea of like, how does this, what was this person thinking in the train ride that when he left Berlin to go and meet the person who would kill him and eat him? And, and it's this way in which I, I, we were thinking about when you go beyond, when it, the, the parallel to terrorism is like almost like you go beyond morality in such a way that it's uncomprehensible because it's just way, to me at least, it's like 
it's just in another realm that is impossible to follow. And um, so these were the things that informed the text, even though the text in, in, has, had parts that are actually news that refers to the, the actual event, but in general, it creates a narrative that is more complex. And um, I will read something that informed, the, uh, and it's a piece by, it's a quote by Blanchot, which I think is, it's, it's always been a really important piece for me from the writing of the disaster, where he, he basically, he quotes, he says, the terrorists are those who desire absolute freedom and are fully conscious that this constitutes a desire for their own death. They are conscious of the freedom they affirm as they are conscious of their death, which they, they realize and they behave during their lifetime, not like people living among other people, among other living people, but like beings deprived of being, like universal thoughts, pure abstraction beyond, beyond, beyond history, judging and deciding in the name of all history, all, all of histories. Um, so um, a race is a, a play that um, took place in a, in a responsive installation set and um, in which the audience became very much part of the mise en scene. It takes formal clues from the Germany, from Germany's anti-theater of Fassbinder and um, the, the setup was like, usually it was for seven, <clears throat> we ran it for seven nights and usually uh, there would be 40 guest seats and um, um, the space was demarked by, with basic theatrical flats painted black which form a corridor around three sides of, all, of the whole like space. The frontal view as well, it was a large black partition beyond which much of the place takes action. Three actors inhabit these corridors and backstage area, placing themselves at various intervals or breaks in the partition to deliver monologues, at time masquerading as dialogue with the other actors. An obscure reflection in a large-scale mirror suspended diagonally above the stage is the only vantage point that reveals the stark choreography occurring behind, behind the dividing wall. The installation becomes the play, and the play becomes the installation. <clears throat> A race, a race crosses the line into territories in which individuals transgress social norms, so completely they vanish altogether. By, exploring, by exploiting a raw physical space and multiple yet concurrent narratives, a race draws comparison to other sorts of transgression, terrorism, art making, and extreme politics. We can play the... Um The sound that you, the, the sort of is because, can you stop for a second, I'm sorry. Just with the image on. I forgot to tell you that we had the amazing opportunity to work in a space that was completely raw. Like, to the, like there was no even floor. Like it was amazing, it was like bombed. Like it was like if you enter a place that was like, you know, after a war. So, um, but with that also came the fact that there was no heating. And this was in uh, uh, late no in November, so we end up providing, um, which became very much part of the play, we provided like each uh, guest with like a, um, a thermal, uh, I don't even know how you call it, those the silver um, blankets that you use in, in extreme cold to like, in, in, um, in emergencies for extreme cold, and they're like, you know, this is the sound that you hear, the click is from those uh, blankets you probably can see in the audience. Thank you. Speculation, attacks. I can hear them now saying, oh, the little gentleman getting all dusty up to start a revolution. But that's the way it was. I would never set out to undertake a proletarian expropriation if I didn't feel that I was dressed right, if I didn't feel comfortable. I see nothing odd about this. Dressing well is not what people think. Dressing well is feeling comfortable and in harmony with one's clothing, with the color, the cut, and the size. So why shouldn't I try to dress well when I'm about to undertake an action? This is how I dress well when I go to the movies. In fact, the fact that the action is necessarily and luckily anonymous 
proof that choosing one outfit and not another is not a matter of showing off. I remember that on this particular occasion, it was mid-November, I put on a pair of green corduroy trousers, elephant cords, and a heavy ski sweater. And it was weird because everybody else, with the excuse completely wrong-headed, as I saw it, that they shouldn't stand out, was wearing clothing that they thought was anonymous and normal. And maybe that clothing was normal, but as soon as they put it on, it seemed strange and outlandish. And that is why I put so much thought in what I wear to the station, in fact, to his house. I need to plan in advance so that I can tell him what to look for when he comes to pick me up, in case he doesn't recognize me from my photo, but also to hide my true mission and to be discreet on the train, kind of like a last meal, but different. You've behaved as I've come to expect. You have learned. I almost became skeptical when that policeman went, remember when he came up to me? Very good. You've proven your worthiness. We will continue with our experiments. Now that you've proven yourself, your suggestions will be considered. I expressly allow it. There must be an elite, even if it is small, a vanguard. You, Hans, are part of that vanguard. A photograph from that day was published, causing considerable uproar. Two <coughs> autonomy firing in the middle of an empty street. One is bent forward, raising his arm as he takes aim. The other has already turned to run, twisting his head to look back as he does. That's what I must have looked like. That's what Piero looked like. White pants, a sweater. Once again, that image of me, stolen from me and projected outward. Frozen in an act that I performed and that somehow I don't recognize in this photograph. That act for me was natural, obvious. And in a sense, it had been decided within me long, long before. Now I see that same act caught, captured, and blocked forever. Gigantic, even though it was an infinitesimal act. And large and motionless, it is given another name, terrorism. Well, between me and them, the definitive line has been drawn. So actually, the, the the thing that in the when he's when he's talking about Piero, the the things he's referring to is actually an image that is probably the, one of the most famous images is uh, is this guy Piero in Milan in 1977, pointing a gun at a policeman, and it became probably it's probably the most seen photograph of that period, and um, um, and it started a moment. It's a very specific. Uh, he, 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 it starts a very specific moment of repression in, in Italy through um, the shooting of a policeman uh, that, and the um, um, consequences that happened. So he's, he, the, the, the person who wrote the book is referring to a, that moment and in, the, in, the, wow. in, the, in the piece. Um, so the next piece we're going to show you is uh, jumps to 2010 and is the piece that we did for the Sculpture Center and it's a collaboration with the uh, architect Tom Zook. And um, I will... Uh, well, in the meantime, I will say something about the piece while we're waiting, and then I'll play the sound for it. Mining the, the anticipation created by an empty stage, in Your Hero is a Ghost, which is the title of the installation, theater becomes the platform for a consideration of the dynamics of power, restraint, and desire. 
When we started to work on the show at Sculptor Center, after we changed our initial project idea of having a survey of our performances, we shift our investigation into the space of performance a sculptor, as a sculptural or architectural site. We focus on the idea of the stage. The exterior courtyard of the Sculpture Center provided us with an amazing opportunity to explore the multitude of special relationships that exist in our understanding of what we would call a stage. We wanted to create a space where the audience ceases to be a spectator and becomes a performer just by virtue of being in the space through subverting the architectural display of a stage. This is why it was important that the bleachers were not to be, were not to be available for seating, but just represented the space of an audience looking. The space of a theater in Mediterranean inspires all, all a, a silent reverent anticipation, but of what? What are we expecting to receive? We started to look at the architectural history of the theater, and amphitheater in Greece and ancient Roma. Then we moved into the idea of the stage as it exists only in, th as it not only it exists only in theaters, but also in sports arenas and concert stadium, sites of a different kind of performance that people are familiar with, but that most of us have never experienced other than as performers, as uh, spectators. The other space that we were interested in was the one that we created underneath the bleacher, a non-space for illegal activities, sex, drugs, the stage of another kind of performance, the performance of underground. Like in many of our works, we present a private space in a public realm. The sound plays a fundamental role in the experience. Created by Candidate, it features actor Jim Fletcher reading the first and last page of Peter Hanke's Offending the Audience. Peter Hanke refers to this work as speak ins quote, spectacles without picture that employs the speech form that are actor in real life. Hanke Offending the Audience is a landmark work in that it rejects illusion and makes the experience of the theater the subject of the work. In Your Hero is a Ghost, we attempt to blur, like in the play, the line that demarks performance and reality, the space of the theater and the space of life. and that. 
You tax evaders. You presidential advisors. You U2 pilots. You agents. You corporate military establishment. You entrepreneurs. You eminencies. You excellencies. You holiness. Mr. President. You crowned heads. You pushers. You architects of the future. You builders of a better world. You mafiosos. You wiseacres. You smarty pants. You who embrace life. You who detest life. You who have no feeling about life. You ladies and gents, you. You celebrities of public and cultural life, you. You who are present, you. You brothers and sisters, you. You comrades, you. You worthy listeners, you. You fellow humans, you. But even in that case, you expected something different. You were welcome here. The next piece that we're going to show you is a um, um, video installation that we did in 2011. It's again another collaboration with the um, um, it's a lot of Kudanyare collaboration with the um, with a filmmaker who. So we got a we uh, um, had a grant f to go to Brest um, to film. Basically, we uh, asked to like uh, have the opportunity to go to to Brest, where Kerel of Brest of Jean Genet um, take place, and where and uh, to actually film the place that uh, Reiner Werner Fassbinder recreates in Kerel, the last movie he did before he died, which is all, which was, uh, which was Fassbinder's um, biggest production, and it was all recreated in the studio. There's nothing uh, filmed in si on site. Everything was created in the studio in Berlin, and it was the, the movie that um, he had the most money for. Um, so we at this grant, we, our, our project was a little bit more complex because we were really interested in trying to like have another aspect of the work in which, because the, there is a complete uh, omitted history of, uh, of both Kerel of Brest by Genet, which is a very important piece of uh, uh, literature, and uh, Kerel by Fassbinder in anything that you search about Brest. And the city is a very, very um, strange place. It's a, it's a big uh, naval, um, it's the biggest naval um, um, uh, base in uh, in France, and um, it is very it is on the on the extreme um, west coast, and it feels like it's a Finisterre at the end of the world. And uh, it was heavily bombed during the Second World War, and uh, it was rebuilt all in the in the fifties. So it has this really 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 stark. And very like um, rationalistic sort of um, um, architecture that is very mel melancholic and very strange. The place has wind constantly, like you're constantly like this wind that is, is uh, blowing, and um, and no people around. This is a very. We were there for a week, and we hardly saw anybody. <laughs> it was like very strange, and. Um, um, and it's very different than anything we expected from like both the movies or the the the, the book. But anyway, the title of our piece is "Off Breast," 
Uh, of Brest is, to, is a split screen video installation made in collaboration with artist and filmmaker Nick Sang. It explores the mechanism that accompany the hiding and revealing of longing and desire that are key both to Jean Genet novel Querelle de Brest and Rainer Fra Wagner Fassbinder film adaptation Querelle. Conceived as a continuum to the novel and the filmic adaptation, Love et Codagnon's video installation is an exploration of concealing and revelation of intention. Variously masking, protecting, revealing, and, and, and engendering his own aggressive passion, Genet brought the theme of disguise to the front front of Carol of Brest, while Fassbinder used the story and the cinematic form to conceal his intention just as they were revealed. In light of their own frustrated and revelatory experience, Love and Codagnone searching footage shot entire on site in Brest and sang durational filmmaking attempt to simultaneously confirm and deny the possibility of Brest as de depicted in, the, in these works of art, asserting the act of representation as one necessarily of private projection, concealment and disguise. In Fassbinder's film, Brest becomes a timeless place of longing where male ritual take place involving love, worship, murder, surrender and sacrifice an artificial space where the actors appear like artificial products. It's an artificial world made out of sheep, brothel, and the narrow street of breast. An artificial glaring sun hangs low on the horizon, bathing the artificial space in hues of orange and yellow. As film scholar Christian Brad Thompson has noted, Fassbinder, quote, Fassbinder did not attempt to transform the novel into what would conventionally be described as cinematic form. Even though the book invites, invites it with dramatic plots, jealousies, duels, violence, murder, and sex. Instead of dramatizing the scenes, Fassbinder goes in the opposite direction. He doesn't let us forget for a moment that what we're seeing is a film version of a novel. In Of Breast, we embark on a search for the sites in, in Genet novels that Fassbinder reconstructed in the studio, exploring the boundaries between the real, literary, and cinematic spaces. Breast consists of the city becomes a transitory space in which Genet and Fassbinder protagonists search for a complete identity. The duration of the video is one hour. The two images running parallel are the same video running forward and on one side and backwards on the other. Right in the middle of the two videos, right in the middle, the two videos becomes the same and switch screen to invert the way they run. Like in the film by Fassbinder, of breast is structured around the psychoanalytic concept of the double and utilize mirroric sensibility, specifically reflecting the duplicity of Carell's personality in the movie. The, the actual, in the movie, the whole um, character of Carell and his brother, they're never, you never understand if the brother is only, it's just another, um, if he's a real person or if it's just another manifestation of Carell himself. The soundtrack is by Candidate. Um, from the movie, Candidate extrapolated the voices of the narrator and that of Franco Nero, which is the, is the lieutenant who throughout the movie records his desire, obsession, and love for Querelle, and disperses the voice throughout the piece, mixing them with the sound of Brest's never-ending wind, a city train mark that never ceases. Brest is the largest and most important French naval base. The city was rebuilt very quickly after the war, giving the city to this day a persistent melancholic and uncanny sense, together with a sense of extreme geographic remoteness, as if the edge of the world is right there. Can you play? Thank you. We just have time to do one thing. Sound.
No? We tried before, we played it before. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about the um, the next piece that is uh, huh? oh yeah actually I do have the sound <laughs> you just play the sound Actually, if you um, if you go to that point, oh. yeah, can you go?
stop here. Um, thank you. Uh, the, th the other thing I forgot to mention about the uh, piece is that um, even though Brest was uh, bombed completely during the war, the only things that remain is the medieval castle and tower, which are opposite, they're divided by water. And uh, actually all the area is like, they're not, um, it's all blocked off, it's all military air zones. So you can, you can basically go to the, 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 the side, but like all the other, the rest is all blocked off. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's also like the, the, the castle and the tower is what, um, has been the recreates in the in the studio exactly it is exactly it, 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 exactly except that it makes them into this phallic um, and uh, adds it makes them into penises. Um, um, what should we do now? We have um, should we show a candidate? Or what is it? Or I think we're going to like just. Uh, this is a piece that this is a piece that we did in um, in uh, Florence. Um, it's called "Truth is Born of Authority." Truth is born of the times, not of authority. Um, it's based on um, the text in the in the sound piece that is done by Candidate. It's, uh, it's from uh, "Life of Galileo" by Bertolt Brecht. And um, um, I'll just show you some images and I'll play the sound in the meantime. And then we'll skip to the last. So each sculpture is basically a sound, as a sound component coming from the from the sculpture itself, and uh, it's barbed wire. It's 13 kilometers of barbed wire in the whole installation. For the last hundred years, mankind has seemed to be expecting something. Our city are cramped and so are men's mind. Superstition and the plug. But now the world is. That's how things are. But they won't stay like that. Because everything is in motion, my friend. The universe has lost its center overnight. indeed what can you see nothing at all you just go gope. goping isn't seeing listen to me don't talk to other people about our ideas why not the authorities won't allow it but it's the truth but they are forbidding it but I'm an honorable man and I tell you this word that hurts my stomach did you hear that a world where one can't do business turns his stomach. Stop standing there like a stuffed dummy when the truth has been found. So um, I'm going to like uh, say, like, let's read a small part of that piece and then uh, we'll end the talk because it's late. But um, the idea when they invited us to do a show in Florence was to somewhere, somehow like, um, 
I mean, the first idea was uh, to use Pasolini because we were in Italy, and then again, we used Pasolini so many times. So, uh, what better occasion than using Galileo, who is from Pisa, which is very close to Florence, and at the time in which we think it was a very important to like um, um, sort of warn and um, I read. Um, it, the, the, the piece can be uh, interpreted as a warning against the lack of critical capacity and a relative uh, faculty of vigilance, against the risk that the Philistine society might unfortunately prevail, a society where freedom of thought and life become exercise, become exercise of an arbitrary power that takes away the essential processes of comparison and progress necessary to uh, achieve an impossible but necessary goal such as truth, in other words, freedom. A parallel in our work and that of Brecht is that we like to create a space for thinking where there are no precise answers given, where the audience does not have a chance to identify or to feel immediately at once with the character in the scenes. The alienation effect central to the dramatic theory of Bertolt Brecht encourages, encourages the audience to retain critical detachment by distancing themselves from emotional involvement. In Galileo, a very important feature is, um, is the engagement of the, of the language and the choice that, that um, Brecht uh, had of using um, Florentine um, um, vernacular, uh, which is a low language, instead of the, uh, the language of the scientist text, which has always been Latin. And that is sort of like, it was uh, seen as, a, as an instrument of authority. Um, we going to, um, I would like to end with the, um, with um, showing you uh, a little clip of, um, so this is a, uh, this is a, um, we were invited in uh, Palermo uh, this summer to do a public uh, piece, which is the one, and that uses the, um, um, the Afor this aphorism by, by Nietzsche says, the conv convictions, is in Italian, but says convictions are more dangerous enemies of truth than lies. And then they also invited candidates to perform, so we asked to perform in front of the, uh, to use the, the installation as a background for the performance. And um, so we're just going to show a uh, candidate and then the, the, um, the candidate actually we're going to show a little piece of, uh, from, um, uh, from Palermo and then he ends with uh, Kate Walk, which is uh, one of our collaborators and, uh, and um, an incredible actress, which is one of the founder of the Wooster Group singing Here to Die, which is our rendition of uh, uh, the song that uh, Jean Moreau ca sings in, um, in um, Querelle, which is written by Fassbinder, and, um, and our version is called Here to Die. The text of Yeah Today and the, the song by Fassbinder is a poem by Oscar Wilde. And it's a poem that he wrote when he uh, was released from jail.
candidates performing at the new museum on November 10th if you're in New York. Any questions? Thank you uh, for the presentation. Thank you for the presentation. I was really I'm wondering um, about. I'd like to hear more about candidate um, because uh, I just observed the way that the sound. Uh, functioned in relation to when the images were used and the kind of shift that takes place uh, with, with that, um, a different kind of animation. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could say something about how you came to that point, because it was yeah. interesting to see the change um, from some earlier uh, work uh, that you showed, uh, and then a shift when you, when you showed the work that was at the Sculpture Center uh, using candidate and combination of the sculptural space uh, and, and the sound. I think actually it's very great, thank you for the question because I think it's a very interesting um, thing that happened. Like I, I think what happens with candidate uh, that to me is very successful apart from the live performance is that in a way um, candidate was born, actually it's a shame that Octavio just left, but candidate was born um, by we were asked to, Octavio was uh, uh, asked us to be in, in, a, in a biennial that he ended up uh, refusing to do for, uh, re for certain reason. But at that time we decided to do, we decided that we wanted to do, we create a stage and in the area where this biennial was going to take place, we wanted to ask to invite hardcore punk bands from the 80s to create a, a, um, a song that, um, based on this sentence by Deleuze. There is an interview in which uh, Gilles Deleuze uh, says that it is uh, uh, necessary to create something new, to say something new in order to create something new. And then he says that for me it's music. So we decide, let's make music out of this. So we were going to ask this. The, 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 the piece, never, the, the biennial never happened. And then we end up recording ourselves, And that was the birth of Candidate because we have collaborated with this person who is a musician to a lot of our performances in order to create the sound. And at this time it became a collaboration in which me and, and John sang actually. And it's a really like our core, like it's very basic, like our core, um, I will play a little bit like, um, um, to say something new. So this was like a very like basic, you know, way to like engage in a certain form of like music, and uh, and from that it became then the piece of the at the sculpture center, and that's when actually uh, kind of became a real band because the the curator, which was amazing, like she said, why don't you perform? And we're like, what do you mean? This is like it wasn't a, supposed to be a real band. It was supposed to be like a ghost band. So. And we say, okay, let's perform. And then the first performance immediately set the tone. And what I think is successful in Candidate, and I think to answer, like, I think that it brings away an enter, enter, it allows to enter the work in a different way because of the sound and the quality of certain sounds that bring certain texts, which are otherwise maybe a little bit more difficult to like, you know, and making it part of like a, a song in some ways is uh, an entrance in the piece that it's interesting to, to watch. I mean, 
we played, uh, Candidate played a, a benefit, <laughs> and uh, it was pretty amazing to see all these rich people that play, that paid to be at the benefit to be insulted by Jim in their face. <laughs> like, uh, I'm loving it, you know? And I was like, oh, that's great. I mean, like, it's, it's one of these moments in which offending the audience is like a piece that is really confrontational and becomes something else because it's mediated by, like, the, the sound. And, um, and I think it evolved from the beginning, the idea of like, which was very basic, into like a, a more complex uh, integration of like our work, since our work has always- So the transformation from us being in the images to us performing, you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah, like and it reflects also like, a, a, it's part, as we were, as Rene was introducing us, like uh, we felt, we believed at one point that it was a, another way of sort of uh, critiquing our own practice was the introduction of the band, as well as like the introduction of actors instead, instead of ourselves, and different formats, like the play, we did another play after that, or, you know, sort of like stepping outside and trying to like, so like the, this idea of cooperation, this idea of like uh, collaboration, it's an easy in some ways because we start from a, a collab we are collaborative, we are a collaborative team to start with, so for us to collaborate with others is like, very easy in terms of like also like share this idea of responsibility, but also uh, share um, the the notion of authorship. You know, we have never had problem with that in in terms of like asserting ourselves, and that's why I believe that in some ways that there's emerging of into candidate that it might also at one point just be candidate, no more love to the union, which is a, a, a um, um, Candidate will also be doing the installation as, for example, at the new museum we'll be doing an install, we'll be reinstalling a piece in a different way that Lava Cagnone did and will be part of the, of the, um, of candidate. So I think that um, there's like, it's, it's evolving in some ways and it's bringing in also elements of our interest in performance which we had uh, sort of abandoned in a certain way. Like in 2005 when we, we, uh, published uh, a book that was very much a war from 95 to 2005. Is when, at that point, we did a conversation we were going to publish in the book with uh, Lia Gangitano. And uh, in that uh, conversation emerged the fact that there was way too much interest in performance, but in the aspect of performance that was not what we were interested in. And that we were kept asking to perform, but in order to entertain. And since we were not performing to entertain, and because I always have, we have always thought about our performances as more sculptural than actual, you know, like, and they were becoming m more durational and static and less dynamic. And, uh, and I was like, I am not interested in uh, um, entertaining people. You know, like being at the opening of a museum, and being paid a fee in order for people to be having an attraction. That's not why, I, I think that our performance has a radical form that has been lost and then uh, now the moment is, is, uh, is uh, collecting performances. So, I mean, th that not to say that per performance artists shouldn't be collected or paid, but I'm just saying that there is a moment in which that something has been lost for me that when we decide not to perform, basically to only perform existing pieces that we're not going to do new performances, which was a lie because in 2010 we actually did a new performance because, which is, is a piece that we're really close to because it's a piece about um, death in, in the sense of like a failure of like Western thinking of um, um, uh, accepting death in certain ways. And, but it's very much about our experience with AIDS and like the loss of a lot of people in our generation and, uh, and it became a piece that we, that it, we will perform at the new museum also at the end of November. And it's a piece that is interesting because it's one of our pieces that is being performed by others and will be performed by others and us are completely interchangeable and we don't, because our presence before was very much us and now I think that we're removing from that Identify, identifying us as the people, as us in the performance, but it can be anybody. So, I just, <laughs> tangents all over, <laughs> as I know. <gasps> Can't help it.
Thanks very much for uh, revealing so much of yourself, I guess, ultimately. Um, I had not been that familiar with your different works, so thanks for that. I guess um, one of the questions then, and is it's sort of general, um, but it's about a trajectory of your career and how you might respond to success and possibly seeing other artists that might change their work or even begin to you know, repeat in a mechanical way the kind of themes they're known for. So one question then would be to, how do you perceive what sort of demands are on you that in a way are challenging your convictions, just to use the Nietzschean word, and how do you try to resist um, you know, altering, you know, the work, but letting it change and grow. You know, we were lucky. We were lucky, and in a way that um, basically what happened to us was that our first body of work, in which was me and John, got a lot of attention when we started to work, and uh, and there was a, very, a specific format in which we. Uh, presented the work, which was the, the, the idea of the photo cubes from the 70s, the plexiglass photo cubes, and we would make installation that had all sizes from like huge to small. And at one point, it became this constant request of this. And our second show, we removed ourselves completely from the photograph, which was like suicide. And it was. And uh, uh, one of our dealers warned us and said, You understand that this, you know, and, um, and you know, we got the worst review we ever had in our life. I mean, it was so painful, but you know what? It freed us completely. And at that point, there was like, it was people still use the phone from home. There was no other, and faxes. The phone stopped ringing. People were not inviting us to shows. Like, it was pretty intense. I mean, it was just like, Okay, we'll and sales. like people cancel the sales from the work. I think some of these photographs are like some of the best photographs we did, but mainly that took us to one of our work we actually will, for the people who will be with us tomorrow in the seminar, uh, one of the most important piece of work, which is an installation based on Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, that we would probably never, at that point, the request for that work was so much in terms of like selling it and showing it that if we stayed there and and we looked at each other and I said, you know, I, and given, at that time I also hated artists that did that, but now since I am like a grown up man and I am in peace with myself, I am actually like respect people, they, people do what they can and you know, we all do what we can do. We don't, I don't think that deliberately people choose to do certain things, but we said, if I have to do this as if I was an accountant, I would have been an accountant and probably make more money. So um, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to produce the same work over and over again. I mean, me and John in leather, we could have done it at MIT, we could have done it in Prague, we could have done it in the moon, but I mean, I mean, we could have done it forever and ever, and, some, and I mean, photography-wise, we don't have to mention the people who are being photograph photographing themselves over and over and over. To me, that wasn't interesting, and that, stepping away from that in a very, like, um, in a way that we thought, oh no, this makes total sense, this uh, really makes sense with the work before, blah, blah, blah. It was immediate, like it was not even like, oh, it took a little bit of time. It was like the day after our opening, like this review by Jerry Saltz came out and it's just like, it was just like so personal as well. It was like, I don't know you. I mean, I don't know where you got there, but like, and changed everything and freed us completely to do what we wanted. And in that sense, like we always, like since then, also I think that people learn to know that we, the work changed and the work keep changing and the work like, you know, the form. So from 2000 to 2005, we only did performances. And thank God for the dealers at that time that stayed with us because we did not produce anything. We did not sell, when we did performance, we did not sell photograph of the performance. I don't believe that. I mean, for us, other people do whatever. That, that is just, you know, or video or documentation of the performance. So they were just events that they, they was not paid. I mean, they were like, you know, basically we would just get fees when we perform for like institution. Otherwise, they were just, you know, things that happen. And for five years, that's all we did. So, you know, some dealers stayed with us, some, some dealers didn't. And, uh, but at that point, you know, then we started to do sculpt. I mean, it just really freed us to like do what we wanted, you know. Uh, 
Okay. <laughs> what I really enjoy about your whole process is how many different types of materials you can access. And I was curious if you have a fundamental methodology in which you approach sculpture or <laughs> music or performance or theater. It's, it's, the gamut is so huge, so I'm just wondering how, as collaborators, you start and how you work. That's actually interesting. It's actually it's something that a lot of people have always asked, you know, because it's clear that in any collaboration, I mean, it's not that we both wake up and start to think the same thing. And uh, what happens is more like, you know, something is put on the table and through discussion, it develops into something else. And, uh, and it's the same way we, you know, it, it, it is the same way we have worked with other collaborators and especially with candidate, it's very much like that because we don't write the music, but the person who writes the music, like when we're about to do a new piece, like now we have a new piece that is going to be uh, coming out for the new museum and he's, uh, he always asks what we are listening at the moment uh, what we are thinking, and like basically we we give direction of what we're thinking, and, and he interprets what we say. So it's a it's a constant dialogue in which then the the like for example, John was talking about feedback a lot. So this has became like this major thing about feedback that then has been you know shaped through. So we've been working on this piece since um, June, and the, the the it was mastered last week for the, for this. We're making a tape, a cassette tape. <laughs> To be, <laughs> and um, um, and the same with us. I mean, there is a, to me, it, it's very specific. My sources are of inspiration are very much the there's certain writings and the certain like literary um, um, sources that I go to all the time. And uh, um, but sometimes the honest, it all starts from like quotes, and uh, I bring up and John's reaction and then, you know, how that gets to the, um, gets developed in some other ways or like. But asking a question not resolving it, you know, not giving the answer. Yeah, and also yeah. like this thing that we, what we, I was trying to like um, hint at before, which making a parallel between us and Bertolt Brecht, which I don't in any possible way, I'm trying to like, you know, parallel us in terms of, uh, but the idea of like, well, like the idea, what well, I, love about Bertolt Brecht's um, theory of theater and, and in, in the plays is this uh, idea of uh, giving the ability to the, um, is to develop critical things, to develop critical um, thoughts about what you see, which is nothing about, I don't think it's even about what you see it itself. I don't think any of the form that we use the form, we don't invent anything. The forms have been all invented. We just reassemble and we just represent it in different, like, you know, uh, configuration. All we can do is to present a set of questions that ultimately will, for someone, uh, present, you know, some sort of, you know, um, way of, of looking at um, something in a different way, but not like, there's never been, and actually, this is a, there's never been any prescription of, um, of an answer to anything. The only, we only present, we only, I, I believe we only present questions because I don't have any answers, <laughs> clearly. And so that is all I can do is present the question that I deal with. And ultimately, through that, it's, you know, I find this myself sometimes looking at work and trying to think, okay, what, where am I going that, with that? And, and I realized that through questioning and questioning and like, and asking the questions, I move on in, in for me in the um, evolution of the work. So I hope that we can inspire people in that way or not inspire, I don't know, like, but certainly, you know, that's, there's never been a prescription of a, any, uh, give, uh, any um, formulated uh, answer to anything because there's never been any. <laughs> okay, so, well, I think uh, you can encourage <laughs> and have done. So thank you very much for being here. Thank um, you. And um, yeah. <laughs> and everyone else, um, thank you for coming this evening. Hope you'll come back. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Good night.